Going live. Let's see if we get this going here. All right, hello. I am Drew Badger, the English Fluency Guide and founder of EnglishAnyone.com. And in this video, we're going to talk about how to teach English as a first language. So not teaching English as a second language, but teaching English as a first language. Hopefully we are working today. It always takes a minute to get uh, subscribers notified. So I'll just give people a moment. Uh, but this should be an entertaining video. This is mostly for teachers, but learners uh, will actually learn a lot from this video. Uh, but I hope everybody enjoys it. All right, uh, so uh, basically, I guess one thing also we'll see, hopefully chat should be working too, uh, and I'll answer questions. I'll try to go slow. I actually have notes over here so I don't ramble too much. So to ramble means just talking about things and you lose focus or whatever. See, it's nice to see you there. Uh, but welcome, everyone. If you do have questions, put them in the comments, uh, and I will do my best. If it's about something I'm talking about right at that moment, uh, then I'll try to answer that. But if not, I will try to keep moving and then answer more questions at the end. I like to keep these videos real, relatively short, at least for the kind of lesson portion of it, uh, and then we'll see how we go from there. All right, uh, so first of all, this is for uh, people, let's see, Rafa's asking about removing an accent. Um, so part of what we'll be teaching in this video is how to fix really every problem that learners have. So it could be accents uh, or great making grammar mistakes, using the wrong words, not understanding natives, all those things uh, we're gonna talk about in this video. So first of all, uh, again, how to teach English as a first language rather than how to teach it as a second language. Uh, and we're going to compare these different things. I'll give you some examples as well as some resources you can use if you're a teacher uh, to help your students learn more like uh, a native speaker, which is really what this is. Uh, so there are basically just two ways of learning a language. Uh, so there is, for our purposes, really there's like learning English. We'll just call this ESL, which is English as a second language. And then there's E. FL, which is English as a first language. So we're going to compare these two methods. Uh, and this is specifically for learning English, which I'll talk about in this video. But this same method applies for anything, because really uh, there are only two ways to learn any language. Uh, so the basic idea is that this is how really like this is the native way that you should be learning a language or that as a teacher, you really want to help learners. Uh, and first I want to talk about why we do this. Uh, so the basic problem with English as a second language is that it puts a lot of uh, what, what I might call like filters or blocks between you and the language. So we begin with uh, like, here's the lesson over here. Here's like the teacher teaching like, okay, here's the alphabet or something. Uh, and then the learner is over here. Uh, and they're not actually getting the real language. So they're getting usually like a slower version uh, or a more kind of textbook version of that. So nice, easier, more formal language. Uh, they're probably getting translations and they're probably not getting like the real way that natives would be speaking. So it's almost like a different language between what real natives are actually speaking and what learners are getting in school. And so this creates all sorts of problems when people try to speak. So we mentioned, or somebody mentioned earlier about the accent. Um, so when you don't learn the real language the way natives learn it, then of course you're going to have problems with accent. You're going to think about grammar rules. Uh, and hesitate when you speak, trying to find the right word. You will often forget words because you don't really know them very well. So because of all these steps, when you're learning the language, you have to uh, re redo these same steps when you try to speak, okay? So the English as a second language approach, and this is not just for English, this is for any language. I'm just focusing on English, that's what I focus on. Uh, but this is the same thing for any language if you're trying to learn it as a second language. And so this means you're learning it through your native language rather than learning it all in English, all right? But the basic idea is that if you're learning through all of these kind of steps that stop you from understanding, then of course you will go through those same steps again when you try to speak. 
Uh, and that's why communication actually becomes difficult. We could just put a little maybe mouth over here. That's a bad picture. <laughs> I'm not the best drawer. Uh, so we'll put a little, here's a little lips over here. But they're basically shut off. Oh no, you can't actually speak. All right. So even though you're learning the language, I want to make it clear here that you are learning the language. You're learning, you know, you're trying to memorize vocabulary. You're learning more grammar rules. <clears throat> but this is not actually helping you speak. Okay. So to contrast the English as a second language with the English as a first language approach, the reason we don't do this and the reason we do this is because we want to eliminate all of these steps. So we want to go directly to the real language as quickly as possible uh, and not put any barriers to learning so that we don't put any barriers to speech. All right. So the basic idea for both of these things is that how you learn is how you speak. Okay, you will probably hear me say this many times. I say it in videos, in my lessons, in writing, uh, all over the place. But the basic idea is how you learn is how you speak. So if you learn and have lots of uh, difficulty understanding things or you're translating through your native language, then of course you will have trouble speaking. But when you're learning the native way, you don't have to worry about those issues because you're just going directly to the language. And that's what we'll talk about in this video. If you have any questions about this basic idea of how you learn is how you speak, let me know. Keep going here with my, uh, make sure we have my, I'm following my list over here. I got my notes. This is great. Usually I don't have notes. I'm just off the cuff, off the cuff for my learners out there, off the cuff. This just means I'm doing something without thinking about it beforehand. I'm improvising, all right? Uh, but this video, I really want to make it for teachers and explain how this works. Uh, so again, uh, I'll share some resources. You can click actually on the links in the description below this video uh, after this video is finished, and that will give you some resources that actually show you how this works and how it's possible. Because most teachers ask me, how can you teach someone English without translating? All right, so I'll show you an example about that in a minute. But hopefully everybody understands this point so far. How you learn is how you speak. And the English as a second language approach, the traditional language learning approach that most people do for learning any language, is creating barriers to understanding so you have barriers when you speak. So it, it stops you from understanding, so it stops you from communicating. All right? And so we don't have that. With EFL, we really want to understand things easily, and then that, that way we can actually become a much more confident speaker very quickly. All right, now before I get into actual examples of this and, and answer some more questions from learners, uh, I want to make it clear about uh, kind of the psychology and the way the brain works for learning languages, or really for learning anything. Uh, because this is important to remember and it explains why it's so important to learn English as a first language or any language you're learning as that first language rather than trying to learn it uh, the traditional way through an additional language. Uh, so the first part about this uh, is that there really is no such thing as a second language. Uh, and so people think, you know, when they're adult, they're trying to learn uh, like, okay, I, my native language is Spanish or French or Italian or Portuguese, whatever that language is. Uh, they think they need to learn English as a, as a second language because they have a native language and then this is the second language. And so we start using lots of translations and grammar exercises and those kinds of things. Uh, but there is no actual second language. There's only just any kind of language. So French, Italian, Spanish, it doesn't matter. All of these languages are the same and it's just how you learn them that's different. Okay, so there is no such thing as a second language. And furthermore, uh, everybody speaks multiple languages uh, already. So an adult English speaker uh, can speak one way with children, one way professionally, one way casually. Uh, so there are different ways of speaking in really different languages. And not to mention the different things you would learn, like the language of math, uh, the language of science, or the language of 
maybe your particular industry. So someone who is even working as a barista at a coffee shop or working in a company doing paperwork, whatever that thing is, uh, they have specific vocabulary that they need to use for each of those things. So everybody already speaks multiple first languages and this is why we know it's possible to learn any language as a first language, all right? So that's the first thing to understand about like the psychology and thinking about how the brain works. So there's only different languages, all right? It doesn't matter what the language is, if it's French, German, uh, Japanese, yeah, it doesn't matter. It's only how you learn the language that's different, okay? Really, really important to understand this, okay? All right, Espanol, yes. <laughs> so if you're trying to learn Spanish, as an example, you should learn it all in Spanish. All right. So how do we do that? Uh, again, I'm going to explain that in a little bit more and there will be more resources. Again, uh, if you want to click on those uh, in the links below this video. Uh, but again, the basic idea, not learning through another language. You want to go directly into the language you're learning. All right. So the first reason to do that, as I just mentioned, uh, is because there are no second languages. It's really just one, uh, one way of learning any language if you want to actually speak. All right, and so let me make sure I'm going here through my notes. All right, so I think we already covered, let's see. All right, so again, more kind of basic, basic ideas or basic points about uh, human psychology and the way the mind works. Uh, so what we're, what we're talking about so far, it seems like a, uh, like a, weird, a, a weird kind of idea, but when you're teaching someone, especially teaching a language, the goal is not really to tell people the answer. As an example, uh, like let's say I teach you Japanese, I'm trying to teach you some Japanese, and I say like, okay, this is uh, red, uh, and I give you a translation in Japanese. I say, uh, I... so if I'm, if I'm just teaching you a language like this, I'm telling you the answer, and that's actually stopping your mind. It's actually making it more boring for your mind to learn. I know this sounds like a, uh, a kind of weird idea, especially for language learning, but the goal again is not to just tell people the answer, it's to lead them to discover it because this is how the mind, the mind likes to solve problems, but you have to make it possible. You have to give the information for the mind to solve a problem or to kind of understand the uh, the translation or whatever without you telling what the answer is. So just like watching a movie, uh, if you tell people what the answer is or if they are doing a puzzle, they're trying to solve something and you just tell them what the answer is, they will be upset about that because they want the chance to solve that by themselves. But language learning as a second language, it doesn't do that. It just tells you what the answer is, okay? So that's like a, a, another really big important point to think about for teaching English uh, or teaching any language really. The goal is not to just tell people what a translation of something is. And this isn't even like a valuable thing to do because you're teaching them to translate. The point is to show them something and just like, look, aka. And I can show you some other things that are also red uh, and I'm giving you examples of that. So like, uh, this is like a red marker and I have uh, like a red, See if they have anything, other things over here. So here's a magnet, red magnet. Aka, aka. So if I hold up 10 different things and they're all red and I say aka, 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 I know that sounds funny to repeat that, uh, you will get that understanding without me telling you what the answer is. Does everybody get that? Okay, this is a really important thing. The point is to help you, it's to lead you to make the conclusion yourself and think, ah, I got it. Okay, he means uh, he's talking about the color. All right, and I'll explain how this works again in a moment, but I really want to talk about the psychology, explain why it's important to teach this way. You don't want to just give the answer because that's boring, okay? It's literally boring to people and they won't, they won't remember what you're teaching them. But if you can lead them to make a discovery, that's how they're going to remember something. And so it's much easier to do that when you're teaching English as a first language, okay? So, aka, aka. Kore aka jana. All right, now you can understand, okay, this is red, this is red, 
not red, not red, all right? So even if I just give you one example, your, your mind is already trying to figure out, okay, what does he mean by that, okay? All right, so here we go, we got red. I'm going to tell you what the definition is. You do not want to do this, okay? This is again, the English as a second language. Well, this would be Japanese as a second language, uh, but the same idea, okay? So we really want to lead people uh, for discovering things, uh, and that's really the goal of helping someone learn a second language. Uh, but you're learning it as a first language, okay? So it's like learning any language as a first language, like a native speaker, all right? That's really the goal. All right, let me go here, here, continue with my, my notes over here. If you do have comments about specific things I'm talking about, uh, like if you don't understand anything I'm covering as I go through it, just let me know in the comments here. Uh, so we've talked about the goal of like leading people and trying to understand things like uh, trying to understand things. It's almost like solving a puzzle. All right. And so that's the, the second kind of big point about this. The third point is that you don't want to focus on speaking. All right. And I know this sounds really weird. Most of the advice that people give for English as a second language or any, any language as a second language uh, is that you're trying to get people to start speaking right from the beginning. Uh, and so I would say, okay, here's like a, a marker and I say aka and then you just start repeating after me. But that's not actually going to help you speak. And the reason, or one main reason at least, why, why basic repetition doesn't help you speak is because learning a language is different from learning something like an instrument. When you're learning an instrument like a, like a guitar, you're learning how to do very specific things and usually for learning to play a song, there's one correct way to play it and then you practice doing that again and again until it becomes automatic. But language learning doesn't work like that. Language learning, uh, specifically the goal of language learning is communication and communication is dynamic. You need to be able to respond. You don't know what people are going to say, so you can't really practice for a conversation by repeating words. But what you can do is get lots of input that's going to help you understand things and that will prepare you for conversations. All right, so I, I've just given you some, like if I hold up 10 different things that are red, you will understand what red is very quickly. All right, and I've done that without just giving you the answer. All right, hopefully this makes sense. All right, moving on. So again, the, uh, another good reason not to not to try to tr try to force people to speak before they're ready uh, is that you can really damage a person's ability to learn. There's like a filter inside your mind that stops you from expressing yourself. It stops you from learning uh, when you don't feel comfortable. And usually you don't feel comfortable because you don't really understand what you're talking about. So usually what's happening with natives as they're learning, I've given this example before as like a, an iceberg floating in water. So we have a, just a little bit up here uh, of, of like talking, talking uh, or speech, but everything under here, the real foundation of communication is understanding the language. So you really understand the language very well and that's what enables you to communicate. So when you're teaching a language, your, your goal as the teacher is just to make the understanding as easy as possible uh, and lead students to really, again, discover, ah, okay, I got it. I understand what something means. Not because you told them the answer, but because they discovered that on their own, all right? So you spend all of your time, basically like 90, you know, more than 90% of your time just giving lots of input. So students get lots of examples of how things work, just like I'm giving you like 10 different things that are all red. And so when you hear that same thing again in these slightly different ways, you really get a strong understanding of what red is in Japanese without me telling you what the answer is, okay? Sometimes it's helpful to explain something, but as best as possible, you really want to make the language easy for people to understand. All right. And we do this by working on giving lots of good input, making the language understandable. Uh, and I'll, I'll explain what I mean by understandable in just a moment. But the point is that we don't focus on speaking. We focus on making the language understandable because when you understand, then you feel confident and that's when you start speaking. So speaking is the result of learning this way. It's not the, the cause of fluency. OK, speaking is the result of learning this way. So after you spend all this time, uh, and it's actually a very quick process, if you do it this way, you will feel very comfortable and you will start speaking automatically. 
So whether you are a learner trying to learn a language by yourself uh, or you are a teacher trying to help people, the point is you spend all of your time uh, just getting the understanding. All right. Hopefully, let's see if I'm missing any comments over here. I think we should be... Yeah, so red aca rojo. That's right. So if you're translating it into Spanish, you don't want to be translating it either. It's much more uh, for, for so many good reasons when you discover something. If I can show you, and I'll give you another example in Japanese. Uh, there might be some Japanese people watching this. So I, I usually I like to give these examples in an alien language. Um, so I'll do that in a moment too. Uh, but the point is you feel so much more excited when you discover something yourself. Okay, that's really the whole point. And so we want language learning is, is a process that actually can happen very quickly. But if you have no motivation, then of course you don't want to learn. If a teacher is just telling you what something is, you don't really remember, you're not engaged in the learning, you don't feel excited, and so you forget what you learn. All right, so we want to stay, want you to keep you, uh, keep you motivated and actually have you, have you really discovering things and feeling much more confident about the language because of that. All right. So I think it looks like we don't have any questions so far. People understand. It's a pretty good idea. All right. So <clears throat> the goal of understanding is the same way you learn. Uh, and you can do this with understandable messages. But let me explain like what understanding means. Because I will often have adult learners say to me, Drew, uh, like this method doesn't make any sense. I already understand the language, but I can't speak. All right. So let me really make this very clear for not only teachers, but learners as well. You, what's really happening when I talk about understanding or how your mind is working is there are kind of uh, like three levels, generally speaking, uh, about understanding or three ways of understanding uh, some new vocabulary or grammar, whatever that is. Uh, and so the first one, I, I guess I could order these in either way. We'll put this as like, I don't know, level, level one, two, and three. So kind of working up from, from down here. Usually the first thing we have here is exposure. Exposure just means you're hearing something or maybe you read something and you can kind of understand it. It's, it's a little bit, um, it's, it's like now known to you. So you just know some information, you're exposed to that information, but maybe you couldn't use it fluently and you, maybe you would probably forget that if you don't hear it again. Uh, second level is awareness. And this is when you recognize something. So if I, if I hear somebody else using it, my passive vocabulary is at this level, and I think, oh, okay, I understand when other people are using it. But I'm still stuck at this level uh, for ownership. So ownership means I'm fluent, and I can actually take that vocabulary and use it. So at all of these levels, I'm still talking about understanding the language. But if we have only exposure, then we will likely forget that information. So this is usually what happens when teachers are moving too quickly or students are learning. Maybe they watch a bunch of YouTube videos that teach random vocabulary and then they don't review that anymore. So you're getting exposure to the language and you might have awareness if you can remember it. But usually this is just like the, the passive vocabulary. And the ownership level is the active the active vocabulary where you actually uh, understand and can use and can recall and, and you actually feel confident really knowing what it means. So when students say to me, Drew, I understand a lot of the language, but I can't speak, this is the problem. Okay, so you're not, you're not actually understanding the language well enough to speak. All right. So I, when I gave the example before about looking at things that different things that are read and you're learning the Japanese for that. Uh, I'll give another example now. And this is where we get the idea from from kind of there, there's is basically two pieces of this. So there's understanding understanding like a native. So understanding like a native means you're getting information all in English and you're learning it the same way a native would learn it. Uh, and number two is the naturally varied review. 
Now, review is important because if you only hear something one time, you will just maybe have the exposure or awareness level of understanding, but you won't actually develop fluency. Uh, and again, this is just how the mind works. We really need to get lots of exposure to the language and we need to hear varied review. Otherwise, if we just hear something, if I just say like, aka, 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 I keep repeating that, you're not going to remember that very well. But if I give you lots of naturally varied review, so an example of this for vocabulary purposes, we've got aka, aka. And if I give you 10 more things, 20 more things, 50 more things, you will really feel very confident about saying the word aka. All right? So understanding like a native and naturally varied review. All right? <clears throat> So hopefully this makes sense so far. I'll give you another Japanese example uh, and then kind of an alien example just in case there are any Japanese people watching this video as well. <clears throat> this is really most powerful uh, for learners and teachers when you, uh, when you don't already know the language, all right? So uh, I'll just give you a quick lesson in Japanese and we'll see what you can understand. Uh, it's important to know that there are different kinds of naturally varied review. So the two things I'm going to do, number one, teach you all in Japanese without having you uh, try to remember anything uh, using your native language uh, or try to give you translations anything because I don't know what your native language is. So I can't use your native language, uh, but I can help you make, uh, make you really make the uh, make Japanese understandable uh, and that will help you learn it. But the naturally varied review comes in many different ways. And part of that is because uh, if I just show you something one time uh, and you never see these words again, then you'll probably just forget them. Again, we're getting to the exposure level, maybe awareness, but we're not getting you to the ownership level where you really feel confident about that. And so we really need to give you lots of different examples, and it could be examples over time. So we give you more examples on different days. I can give you a lesson today, you come back tomorrow, you learn a little bit more, you extend and you deepen your understanding, and then that's where you start feeling more confident about speaking. All right, so we don't have you practice saying anything. The goal is not to repeat me. It's to understand the language so well that you remember it and can use it automatically. All right, so a quick lesson in Japanese. Maka, 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 maka. Akai maka, akai maka. Aoi maka, ao, aoi maka. Aka, akai maka. Aka, aka, aka. Akai jishak, 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 jishak. Shiro, shiroi jishak. Akai jishak, shiroi jishak. Aka, ao, kuro, kuroi maka. Ao, aoi maka. Kore, maka, kore. Sore, kore. Sore, kore. Sore, kore da. Kore, kore da. Sore da, kore da. Sore da, kore, sore. All right. So that was just a very basic uh, example in Japanese. And if I could continue teaching you that and give you lots more examples, and you also heard different native Japanese speakers giving you those same examples, of course you would become fluent automatically. It would be guaranteed because we're teaching you the way your mind, the way your brain wants to learn languages. All right, does that make sense? All right, so let me give you another example of this naturally varied review in uh, a different language, all right? So if I'm teaching you, let's say we're, we're trying to teach some aliens uh, some English or something like that, or aliens, or we're going to a different alien planet, and I give you a kind of typical flashcard here. Uh, let me see, I'll gonna, I'm going to put this, try to, try to give like a pretty good uh, picture of this thing. So if I show you this, just give you a flashcard, and I say, blah, blah. 
So imagine I'm, I'm like an alien trying to teach you something. Ara, chimpo ga mari yatte kita yo. Blah, blah. So if I just show you this, your understanding level is maybe like, could be 80%. So you're thinking to yourself, I don't know, what does he mean? Maybe I mean shape. Maybe I mean uh, tool. Maybe I mean wrench. Something else. And so if I only give you one example of something, it's making it more difficult for a learner to understand. All right? And so if I just say, blah, like a, like a regular teacher in a classroom and I'm holding up a flashcard, I say, blah. And students are looking like, I don't quite understand what that means, all right? It's not immediately clear, and the goal is, again, helping you really understand it. So we want to take you from 80% all the way up to 100% level of understanding, because then you would feel confident about saying the word blah, because you'd know what it means. You would understand it, you would understand it well, you would feel confident about using it. So I give you another flashcard. Uh, let's, let's see this. Blah. So blah, blah. Now you're understanding maybe you're, you're moving a little bit forward. So we know we're not talking about a wrench because this is not a wrench. It's a different thing. All right. It could be a shape. It could be a tool. Maybe. So our understanding is improving. Maybe we're at like 90% because we can, we can guess maybe this is a, like a, a little bit better. So I give you yet another flash car. And this is where I'm going to give you, let's see, here's uh, something different. And so with each one of these things, blah, 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 and if I give you maybe 10 more examples of different things, it would become clear, okay, he's talking about a tool. But this is, it's on the teacher to explain this and make it clear for learners, okay? So if you just show something one time, if you have one example of something, it's really not very clear what it is. And that's why people use translations, because they don't have a better way of making it clear to learners. So they have to use translations that just say, OK, like we can't just explain what it is and help you get more examples of something. We're just going to tell you what the answer is. And that ruins the learning. OK, so that ruins the motivation. It destroys the understanding and you're just going to make it forgettable. So this is why I'm going to give you a bunch of different examples and I'm trying to help you really. This is one example of naturally varied review where your understanding is likely not perfect from the first one. So we give you more and more until we can get you all the way to 100%. And when you feel you are at 100%, that's when you want to speak. That's when you feel confident and comfortable. Okay. So we don't start by having you repeat words or say them out loud. What we do is really make the language understandable. Okay? So that's, again, we want to, like, if I just expose you to the language, if I say blah, I want to take you from awareness all the way up to ownership. So you really feel confident, blah, 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 blah. You're hearing it again and again, but in different ways. And each of these really help to, uh, you're kind of, like, trying to find the target and understand something the same way a native would. Now, it's interesting to note here that uh, even as natives are learning their native language, most natives are not learning their language this efficiently. So a child might hear blah, like their dad says like blah, and they don't know if their dad is talking about the color, the shape, what it's used for, if we're talking about a general group of something, it's only over time as learners get more examples of things that they really start understanding, ah, okay, now I remember my dad said like two years ago, <laughs> my dad said blah and he meant wrench or he meant tool or he meant whatever, all right? So the really great thing about being able to teach a language, if you teach it like a native, but you teach it this way, you can actually get fluent faster than natives are getting fluent because you're making the language really understandable. Isn't that cool? So without trying to uh, make the language too easy, uh, you can still give lots of naturally varied review, make the language understandable, students feel excited about learning, and again, the progress happens very fast.
All right. So you're not telling people what the answer is. You're leading them to discover what that is. Uh, and, I, and this is why, like, we have these multiple icons in Frederick. Uh, so this is an app we created for people specifically learning English as a first language. It's one of the resources you can find uh, at the link in, uh, in the link in the description below this video. Uh, but the basic idea is that if we give you only one image for something, uh, it's much easier for you to forget that or to not really understand it very well. But if we give you multiple images, it's all of them together that create these layers of understanding. And when you really understand something, then you speak. Okay? It doesn't make any sense to try speaking before you feel very confident about what you say. So again, we don't want to spend time telling learners things and having them try to repeat them after us. You don't get fluent by repetition. As I mentioned earlier in the video, remember, uh, language is dynamic. Communication is dynamic. So we don't want to spend time uh, repeating things when we might hear something completely different in a conversation. But if we get lots of different examples and we really feel confident about something in the same way, uh, we don't just hear one person speaking. We hear lots of different natives giving these same examples. And in that way, you feel very confident about what you're hearing. Okay, so I'm hearing 20 different natives say the same thing. You feel very confident about that. You really understand it. You're prepared in conversations for that. And that's when you start speaking. Okay, so specifically for teachers out there, uh, the goal is not speaking from the start. The goal is understanding from the start. And then you become a more confident speaker. All right. And let me see if I have anything else uh, I wanted to talk about for this. It's much easier for you to see how this works. Uh, and rather than me giving a whole bunch of examples in this video, I created a whole playlist. Uh, this was even uh, over 10 years ago. So I've been teaching this way for many years. Uh, and right on YouTube, uh, there's a playlist you can click on in the description as well uh, that will show you these steps for someone who's an absolute beginner. So part of this can be done with that playlist. It's just learning uh, through videos if you want to watch someone so it actually shows me uh, teaching English all in English. So it's learning English as a first language for absolute beginners. And this is also good for people who still make a lot of basic mistakes. Uh, the other thing you can use also is Frederick, which is also linked in the description uh, below. Uh, and another thing, I created a blog post, or it's really like an actually long article, uh, about the five main ways that people learn different languages. So people want to learn English. Uh, there are five main ways that people do this, and I cover all of that in that article as well. And then, of course, we've got Fluent for Life, which is how learners, uh, adult learners, are learning the language. And they are focusing on this way of learning for people who already understand a lot of English but can't speak. So the big problem for most of those learners, they're at the understanding level, but they don't, they don't really think, or it's, it's probably my fault for not being clear enough about those different stages of understanding. Uh, so when I say like the goal is understanding, people think like, oh, okay, I know the vocabulary, but I can't speak. So the problem is you don't really know the vocabulary well enough. You're not really spending enough time with it. And even if you don't speak, you can still become fluent uh, because the goal is understanding. All right. All right. Now let me go back and uh, answer some questions, but I think that covers everything. Again, the, the basic idea of all this is really just learning English the same way a native would learn it. All right. But you can actually do this much more efficiently if you can get the right information to learners. So as a teacher, you should be thinking about that. How can I make the language understandable all in English rather than me trying to use translations? So if you use a translation, it means the language is not understandable. OK, if you use translations, it means the language is not understandable. And as you go through this process, I've given you some basic examples with simple things and visual things. But obviously, as the language becomes more advanced, you should be able to use all of the things, all of the vocabulary you learned so far to explain more things in more advanced ways. But it can all be done in English. All right. So let me go back and look at questions, but that's the basic idea about this. I didn't want to take uh, so long, and hopefully if there are any other questions about this, I can explain them. But let me go back through comments. Uh, looks like we got some people saying hello from various places. Nice to see everybody here. Got Venezuela, Brazil. Keep your accent. This is part of your identity. Yes. So, so again, like the, the accent when people 
I, I know a lot of people are interested in either removing their accent or developing a particular kind of accent. Uh, accent is less important than grammar. And this is how you learn, well, grammar, vocabulary, everything. Uh, but don't worry so much about your accent. If you have an accent, yes, like it can, uh, like part of the accent is part of who you are. Uh, and also it's less important than grammar. The point is really to be correct when you speak. And if you sound, you know, you have an accent or whatever, as long as it's understandable, then I wouldn't worry so much about that. But it is nice, like for me, I like to, like if I'm talking on the phone in Japanese, I want people to think like, oh, is this guy Japanese? Japanese or not. That's just like part of my goal for that. But each person has their own their own goal. All right, let's see here if we have any, any more questions. Um, let's see. Hello, everyone from Ecuador. More Brazil. Brazil's in the house. Yes, Bangladesh. EFL so much better. Yes, Lucas, you're right. Uh, saludos desde, let's see. I can't, I can't even, I'm not going to try to read that. I can't read that well, I'm sure. <laughs> Ecuador. So this is another example of like, if I just, if I just read something uh, and I can't pronounce it correctly, I'm probably not going to feel very confident about saying it. But if I hear 10 different people speaking and like hear, you know, the name of something, then I'm probably going to understand it well and feel a lot more confident about that. Good morning from Nepal. Uh, let's see. Kramer says, I love your method of teaching and learning the language. Yes, remember, I, I haven't done anything special or different. All I'm doing is making it clear how the, like, the, the native process works and letting teachers and learners know that it's possible for you to do that also. So you don't need to be a native to learn like a native. Okay? You don't need to be in a native English-speaking country to learn like a native. You really just need to get the right input, and this is what we do in videos or in programs like Fluent for Life or Frederick. We've created these systems that allow people to learn all by themselves, and you can actually become fluent without speaking this way. All right. Uh, let's see. And, of course, we get a, uh, an ambulance or something, like usual. Uh, how's it going, Kazakhstan online? To hear, glad to hear it, Ilda. Nice to see you there. I uh, recommend you guys watch Ellen Two. Very good uh, to practice your listening. Yes, well, like when people talk about watching a particular thing, uh, there's a very useful, useful kind of proverb. It takes a village to raise a child, and this means you should not be only listening to me for improving your English. You want to listen to lots of different people, including mostly natives. So rather than trying to listen to a bunch of teachers, you should be working up to understanding the native level uh, because, again, the way teachers speak is often very different from how natives actually communicate, all right? So including myself. So what we do in Fluent for Life is we actually take you through these different steps uh, from the, the kind of understanding at this level to understanding at the native level and feeling more confident about that. Uh, so active alone, how can we do this in a good level? Um, so again, it's about getting more naturally varied review. I give an example of this uh, for adult learners who already understand a lot of English. There's a recent video I made about making espresso, uh, and that is... Uh, it's, it's got different examples of, it's one kind of naturally varied review. And so this example is you watch different people doing the same thing. And so they would talk about it in slightly different ways. So you would have some overlap in the vocabulary. So in that video, I walk you through uh, four different videos about making espresso. And you can do this by yourself. Obviously, the benefit of having a guide like me is that I can explain to you what the vocabulary is in a natural native way. But you watch, let's say, the first video, and maybe there are a lot of things you don't understand, but you watch the second video, and you think, oh yeah, look at that. Here are some, a lot of the same words and phrases that appear again. And we watch a third video, and look at that, all these same words and phrases are appearing again. And you're going to get a little bit of overlap here and here. And then we watch a fourth video, and look at that. So all of this vocabulary in here, you're going to feel very, very confident about that. And this increases as you get more. And what you'll notice as you're a learner or even as you're a teacher, and you notice this in your students, is when they understand something, uh, they, will, they will really feel confident about saying that. So especially little kids. Uh, and after you reviewed something so many times, you know the pattern 
So the language pattern in the uh, one example from that video uh, is taking some coffee and, and pressing it down uh, in the little coffee filter. Now in like the coffee world, this is called tamping something down. So to tamp down the coffee. But I had never heard of that. Like you, I know the word tamp, but I had not heard it used in that way. I didn't know that was even a, like a special word for that industry. And so now I know the word tamp and I could explain how to make espresso just by watching all of these different videos about doing it, all right? So as I hear something more and more, I will anticipate that in conversations. I will know what people are going to talk about and then it, it really helps me to, to understand kind of how the flow of conversations work uh, or how people are going to describe something, all right? So if there are especially steps in doing something, this is a really great way to learn uh, for, for anybody trying to learn by themselves. And this is what we do in Fluent for Life. So we want to give you uh, not only the real language, but we want to give it to you again and again and again in different ways. The point is really not to be bored as you learn and to help you discover the language for yourself rather than me just telling you the answer or giving you a translation in your native language, all right? Now, uh, one final point about this that I'll say for teachers is that it's it's really uh, it's important to remember that learners will often not tell you if they don't understand all right so imagine you're a teacher in a classroom and you've got lots of students and you give them an example of something and you say hey does everyone understand this and if people do not understand they will usually not say so all right they will not admit that they don't understand something and so even natives when they are learning, like a parent is trying to explain something to their child, uh, that student or that child might not understand, but they just like, yeah, I, I understand, you know, <laughs> because it's embarrassing if you don't understand. But the truth is it's the teacher's fault if the child or student does not understand something, all right? So it's my fault as a teacher if my lessons are not understandable. Okay, so that's why I go over things again and again and again, and a lot of my videos are just talking about the same thing in different ways. And it's interesting to see when learners, uh, like they go through examples of things and they, like one, one student might learn one thing and get it quickly, and another student might take a few times and, and they still get it. But that's why I cover things in many different ways. So remember, most people will, will not admit they don't understand something. So until you can see it in their eyes and they start wanting to speak, just keep reviewing that information. Uh, let's see. All right, Foxtrot says, good evening, teacher. Curious says, hello, you help us a lot. Thank you. Sometimes I feel good at English, but sometimes not. It depends on my mood. I don't know why. Well, psychology is a very important part of learning. And so the way you feel, you might be uh, feeling confident on a particular day. I know even me, sometimes I'm like, oh, my Japanese feels like a little bit worse today. Or my Japanese feels awesome today. It, it just happens like that. Also, you will notice, uh, depending on the, the thing you're talking about, so if you're talking about something that you know very well, then you can probably feel more confident about that. Uh, but if you don't feel confident about that or you don't know that vocabulary very well, you will feel less confident uh, and that will affect your speaks, uh, speech. Uh, all right, and uh, let's see, Paulston says, Hi, Drew, newbie ESL teacher in China here. I have a question. When you teach, how long do you stay on a topic to take a group of adult learners from exposure to ownership, and how do you know when? So again, uh, remember, people will not likely uh, say that they understand something, so you really should make it very clear. You're teaching it all in English. You're giving them many examples until like, you can kind of see it in their face. This is a lot easier to do, uh, especially if you have a classroom of people and you're looking at them. Uh, right now, I can't see your face. So anybody watching this video, I can get it. Like if people uh, type something that's like, oh, I get it, I understand, then I know they understand. But again, it's nice if you can actually see their face. So if I'm teaching my own children, I can see if they really understand something or not. And the true test is if they can actually use it themselves. But the important thing here is I don't want to put pressure on them to speak, especially before they're ready. Uh, the goal, again, is not for them to speak. It's for me to make the language understandable, and then they would feel confident using the language after that. So I would 
repeat something as many times as I need until they're like, all right, we get it. Like, I understand, you know, it's like, okay, like ask them a question and see if they respond back. So if I keep giving you examples in Japanese and like if I keep doing it and I see you're like, okay, like we get it, we get it. It's like, all right, do you get it today? And then I would test them again the next day and the next day to see if they actually still understand that. So they might understand, understand something at the moment. You probably remember aka. So I'm talking about the color red in Japanese. Uh, but maybe tomorrow you've forgotten. Okay, and that's understandable. Again, if we, you know, knowing the, the word for, for uh, red in Japanese is not essential for your daily life, so you probably will not remember that information. But if you're trying to learn the language uh, and you want to be reminded of that, you should be reminded in a different way, so in a different context. I don't want to just repeat it like these flashcard things, uh, spaced repetition. It's much more efficient to learn with naturally varied review because your brain learns more from getting these varied examples than it does from just seeing the same thing again and again. All right, so it's boring to the brain. The brain wants lots of new examples. Okay, so good question. Uh, I would take more time and again, Test them on, on future, future days as well. So use that, use that time to review. It's much better, especially if you're trying to get people to speak, uh, to focus on stuff more than, than most people would feel like comfortable with. But the point is if you're using different examples, so if you just repeat something again and again, it will get boring very quickly. But if I give five different examples of something all in the same lesson, it's covering the same topic, uh, then it will be much more interesting for people and they will naturally enjoy that lesson more. Uh, <clears throat> uh, hello from Angola. This is uh, Afonso. All right. Hopefully. All right. I, th I think I answered Paulson's question. Good question, though. Hello. <laughs> All right. I'm learning more English on here than my college classes. <laughs> Yes, uh, and you will learn even more when you just focus on uh, adult or just really content for natives. Uh, so what I do in these videos is trying to help learners and explain to them that number one, they can get fluent like a native, and number two, it's possible to do that without being in a, like a native English speaking country. So the point is really to focus until you understand something very well, uh, and that's how you know you can understand it, like you can use it. So that's how you, how you know you're getting to that level. All right, Afonso, again, how can I get motivation for learning new vocabulary? Uh, it's gotta be interesting for you. It should be like a puzzle you're trying to solve, all right? So often like you're either trying to review something and hear it in different ways, or you're learning some new content and you understand maybe 80 or 90% of it, all right? So the, the language learning process, uh, especially for new vocabulary, it works like a puzzle. So if we imagine our puzzle here and we've got, uh, you know, like different, different puzzle shapes Usually, uh, as you're starting to get fluent, like if you imagine a baby, a baby will over time begin filling in these puzzle pieces. But as I mentioned earlier in the video, parents are not very efficient about how they teach. So the baby will get like a random example, and this could be you know, a six-year-old kid or even a 10-year-old kid, something they might not understand an example with only one. But as they continue to get more examples, they fill in the understanding of that. And so if you're trying to learn new vocabulary, uh, you should have all of these pieces mostly filled in. So you understand already 80 to 90% of something. So if I'm going to read a book in Japanese, I should understand most of it. So anything new I can understand from the context. All right. So when you're teaching people, again, this is a great reason why uh, a non-native non learner can get fluent much faster than a native, because the teacher, if the teacher does a good job, uh, you can make the language very understandable very quickly. So you can teach it efficiently, make sure people really understand things uh, without spending a lot of time doing things the traditional way. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, uh, so hi everybody from Malaysia. How can I, oh, okay, I answered that question already. Yesterday I tried to catch the jokes from movie Dumb and Dumber, but several got mostly missed, unfortunately, but I tried. Yeah, so that just means there are too many like empty pieces of the puzzle. 
And remember that you might understand vocabulary, but you might not understand cultural references or particular uh, uses of that vocabulary. So that, that's the thing that you learn over time the same way a native does. So natives will often not understand a joke in a movie if they also don't know some kind of reference. There's actually a funny uh, joke about this in, I think it was the, uh, the Avengers movie. So in the Avengers movie, if you have not seen that, it's a, a bunch of superheroes that are together. They make a superhero team called the Avengers. Uh, and one of the characters, uh, what's his name? Tony Stark is the guy who plays Iron Man. So he likes to make little little quips, little kind of jokes. He says funny things. Um, and what's interesting about the, the team is that they're all from the same time period. Uh, actually, I think, well, like Thor, one of the characters is, I mean, he's like from a different planet or whatever. It's kind of confusing. Uh, but the interesting thing is one of the characters, Captain America, uh, he's much older because he was basically frozen for a long time and they brought him back into the present. So in his, his movie, he's like, I don't know, 50 years older than everybody else, but he still looks young. So there's a, a point in the movie where uh, the characters are telling different jokes and Captain America doesn't understand what they're talking about. He's like, I don't understand. But then they use a, a joke that's a little bit more from his time period. And he's like, ah, I got that reference. He says, I got that reference, all right? So that's an example of him knowing the language, but not knowing the joke. So don't feel bad about that. It's just a, you know getting, getting used to the language. That's something that happens naturally as you start learning more like this. We actually cover a lot of that in, uh, in Fluent for Life. So we're trying to show people like, here's what the reference is, and here's the kind of thing, how, here's how you can learn more about that, and here's why the joke is funny, that kind of thing. Uh, all right. Uh, so Alfonso says, what is the best way of learning vocabulary in English? So I've just covered that here. Uh, and again, that's really helping you understand things like a native. So uh, naturally varied review where you're learning, you're focusing on one particular word or expression and you're hearing that in many different ways from different speakers in different tenses. All of that is going to help you use the vocabulary very easily. All right, Ilda says, then I watched Forrest Gump and shadowing the Tom Hanks accent. It was so funny. I think it is the best way to study and have fun. Yeah, so if that's working for you, fantastic. Uh, if you can understand a whole movie like that, that's great. Your English is already at a good level. But if you still have mostly a passive vocabulary, uh, I would focus more on particular things that you, that you struggle with. Uh, hi, everyone from Vietnam. Nice to see you there. Good to see you. Uh, I'm Magno from Brazil, Sao Paulo. Stanley says, great job. Thank you. Oops, not watch, watching. Good evening. Is this live? Yes, it is. Uh, let's see. Yes, it's live right now, but if you're watching it later, then it's not. <laughs> All right, so Lewis says, yes, psychology, good answer. Yes, it's, it's interesting to think about the psychology of language learning, and a lot of teachers don't focus on that. They just focus on the language itself. But if you don't know a lot of things about how the human mind works and how the human mind learns, then you're kind of wasting your time. Uh, so Mohammed says, uh, I cannot remember words. Yes, you're, so you're stuck at the uh, exposure or awareness level of understanding and not at the ownership level. And it just means you didn't get enough varied review to get you to that higher level. Uh, if you watch, what view? I, I have a video that talks about that, like the three levels of understanding. Uh, it's a recent live video I did. I would watch that uh, if I were you. All right, Drew, I enjoyed the video about espresso. Glad to hear it, Sita. Uh, yeah, so the, that's just one example of that to help people understand like it is possible and you can continue. I would spend more time. The reason I picked those videos is because they wouldn't like get me a copyright strike. <laughs> So I, I was, it was funny, I just took like the top four videos I found for that. But you will find a lot and I would recommend like listening to different people, like listening to women speak. I didn't have any women in that video because I couldn't find any. Um, but I would recommend people go out and you will, you will learn even more. Even if you watch the exact same vocabulary from two different speakers, you will learn a lot more. Uh, let's see. All right, Sanafi, Sanafi, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, my beloved teacher, it's my pleasure, glad to hear it. Pauls and thanks, Drew, glad to hear it. Uh, let's give Drew lots of uh, little thumbs up. Yes, please do, if you know other people who would like to learn this way. What I do is really helping people who know a lot of English but still struggle to speak. Really, the reason is they're just not getting review and the naturally varied review, that's like, that's, that's really the, the uh, 
probably the most important thing that I teach of like, you know, I think a lot of what I do is important, obviously, but the naturally varied review point is really important because it gives you the review you need without being bored. Uh, so hello everyone, says Lucas again. Salima, I don't feel any improvement in my skill after my beginner classes. What advice can you recommend for me? Uh, Salima, I would recommend learning English as a uh, native speaker. So English as a first language rather than learning English as a second language. Your beginner classes, I'm guessing, taught you English through your native language and it created more problems than uh, solutions unfortunately. Uh, so it's not your fault if you have trouble communicating. It's really just the way most people teach the language. And so as soon as you make this switch, and you can do this, like we have this at all levels at EnglishAnyone.com. So the lowest one, again, you can begin with uh, that video playlist that we have right here on YouTube. If you watch that, that's in the description. Uh, Frederick will do this as well. It's also in the description or Fluent for Life for people who already know a lot of English but still can't speak. Uh, so that's for intermediate to advanced learners. Uh, Paul Zanez, press the like button. Drew is awesome. Glad to hear it. Konnichiwa, Drew, says Elena. Nice to see you there. Uh, Pratik says, I'm always stuck while talking in English. Yep, again, the answer I bet people can guess. Naturally varied review. You just need to get more review, and the varied review is really important. It's not just repeating something again and again. It's hearing it in different situations from different speakers in different time periods. Uh, all of that is going to naturally improve your vocabulary and your memory and make you feel much more confident. Uh, spend time memorizing words with spaced repetition words. No, I would not do that. Uh, again, like spaced repetition is useful only because people don't think about like naturally varied review and how, how language learning really works for, for communication. So the goal is not, it's not even to like just remember vocabulary. Really the goal is to prepare yourself for spontaneous communication. All right. So remember, language learning is different from trying to learn to play an instrument or even learn like a physical, like a like a punch when I'm doing a martial art, something like that. So if I'm learning karate, OK, I'm going to do like my punch and practice that again and again. Uh, but maybe in a in a real fight, someone breaks a bottle over my head and oh, oh shit, like now what am I going to do? I like maybe they maybe my arm is held down and I'm not prepared for that. All right. So there's different kind of practicing that you do. Uh, for particular things, but learning, like trying to practice a song where you repeat something again and again to get good at doing that, that's not going to prepare you to play jazz music and to improvise and to make your own kind of music very well. That's a different kind of learning. So when you're learning in a conversation or preparing for a conversation, uh, the goal is really uh, to be ready for, for, number one, all of the, very, the various things that you might hear from other people, uh, but then also to feel very confident about the kinds of responses you would make. All right? So you need to first like, feel confident about listening uh, to other conversations. Often people or other people in conversations. Often people will feel, uh, they will feel nervous about expressing themselves or they will not feel confident about, about what they say. Uh, because they're worrying about what they will say and they're, they're kind of in their own head. And this is a problem for English as a second language learners. Uh, let's see. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. So, so much better than spaced repetition is naturally varied review. Ellen says, I'm not able to travel to Japan. I will have to meet you. I'm not in your hometown. Yeah. Uh, so I think, Ellen, you're in Chicago, I think. <clears throat> uh, my dad is actually coming out here next week. I haven't, he's never been to, well, he's never been to Japan while I've been here, uh, but he will be here next week. Uh, so I get to hang out with him. He's bringing some Chicago with him, I guess. <laughs> All right, so Fallout says, uh, thanks a lot, Andrew. You are the best. I learned with you, and today I'm an English teacher in a private school. Wow, fantastic. Hopefully you are following the EFL method. I know that's, uh, it's more difficult for some people because their school makes them learn this way. I don't know why anybody continues to do this. Uh, I mean, my basic idea is that most people don't think it's possible uh, to learn English as a first language. They just think it's not possible to translate. Um, but even if you're only teaching for a test, this is still a much more efficient way of learning. So it's much faster and the learners would learn how to speak as well. Uh, Salma, nice to see you there. Hi, coach from India. I understand a little bit, but I don't speak. Help. Yeah. So uh, Lillian, just spend more time with the language, with specific things you want to learn, but it should be all in English. All right. 
So if you don't understand something, again, we got our exposure, awareness, ownership level of, of communication. Uh, so we, if you only uh, like hear something one time, you will likely forget that uh, and you will not really understand the language well enough to use it. So this is why, uh, I mean, uh, just to make it very clear for people, people argue with me about this, but if you don't feel confident, if you don't know something, then how would you be able to speak? If you don't know something, if you don't know vocabulary very well, if you don't feel confident about it, how would you be able to speak? All right, so why focus on speaking first? You don't focus on speaking first, you, spoke, you focus on understanding it. And then when you feel really confident because you understand something, that's when you speak. Uh, let's see, and it says, how do I learn English as a first language? Go back and watch this video. <laughs> watch this video again. Uh, but the basic idea is the things I'm talking about. Number one, learning all in English. Number two, getting naturally varied review. So this is not uh, traditional like uh, spaced repetition where you're just hearing something again and again. We want to give you lots of different varied input. It really makes the language easy to understand. It keeps you motivated and it builds your memory and fluency automatically. Uh, let's see. So Lillian, oh, you guys are speaking with each other, okay? And Pratik says, sir, is English your first language? If not, then what's your first language? Yes, my first language is English. Uh, my second language is Nihongo, Japanese. Uh, but I don't really, uh, now that I understand more about language learning, I don't really think about them as like my first and second language. It's just both of them are my first language, but uh, one of them I just know less. So I know less Japanese. Uh, but I, I'm learning them both like a first language. All right, so you can know multiple first languages. This is how you should be thinking about it. Uh, Salima, again, I didn't learn anything in my native language. I have American Canadian teachers, but my problem is that I have a strong language only inside the classroom. Outside the classroom, I feel bad. Yes, so again, the uh, most people spend time in this. It's like a bubble, a language learning bubble, where they don't really get much exposure to uh, to the real language that natives are using. Most people teaching language in a classroom are not going to give you the, the real language that natives speak. And so this is another reason why people ask me, Drew, please teach me privately, give me private lessons. It'd be a waste of your time uh, to get private lessons because you shouldn't be learning only with one person. And you should be learning with lots of native examples. All right. So not only learning with me, but like lots of native people who are actually speaking the language the way it is in real life. And so what we do is we, we get you up to that level, like the first lesson you'll hear it, it's easier to understand, we're teaching you a lot of vocabulary, but then you hear that same vocabulary and grammar used in a real conversation. So you hear how natives would blend their words together. Uh, and, and again, like you, you need a way to bridge that. I call that the fluency gap. So you're able to understand and communicate in a lesson. But if you can't do that in a real conversation, it means you're not getting enough review and practice to get you up to that level. All right. <clears throat> uh, all right, Pablo says, great. Uh, how can I learn German from English? Or, uh, or should I use the same method? Yes. So remember, every learn every language as if it's your first language. That's the secret. All right. That's re that's really the whole. That's the secret under underpinning everything else. It's like the one ring to rule them all. You know, you got like there's all these other you know secrets or things about language learning, but this is the core. If you learn it as a first language, like a native speaker, you will become fluent much faster than doing anything else. And in fact, most things like learning it as a second language will prevent you from doing that. Now, unfortunately, I don't know uh, anybody who, who really does this. There's really nobody who does this in English but me. Uh, so you will get lots of people that teach English in English, but really going into the detail um, and, and trying to make it understandable and giving you the naturally varied review you need to, to not only make it like it's like a simulation of a native environment, but it's much more efficient. Uh, but I don't know anybody who does that in other languages. Um, so it's kind of hard. Actually, I want to do a um, like a challenge just for myself, just to spend maybe a week uh, if I had like some language learning material in a different language that, that teaches the way I teach, like the way I teach in Frederick uh, or the other videos I have, if I had something like that for a different language, like learning Arabic or Hindi or something like that, I would, I would do that just to show people it's possible to do that. But I, 
nobody has that information available. I'd have to kind of create that myself, which is kind of a pain in the ass. You know, this is, this is why it took me a while to get fluent in Japanese once I understood this. Now I can just understand things very easily. Uh, but if you don't have a teacher there to give you the material, it's more difficult to, to follow the system. <clears throat> Uh, let's see. So yes, if you can learn German uh, in German. All right. Uh, oh, and uh, again, Shyam, hopefully I'm pronouncing that again correctly. Thank you for all the great comments. It's nice to see you visiting the channel. Thank you again. Uh, glad to hear it. Glad to hear we're being helpful. Uh, yes, living in Chicago. Say hi to your dad for me. Yes, I will say yes. Miss Elena is also in Chicago. Let me. What's what area specifically are you in? So we are in uh, like the south side. Ariel says, uh, greetings from Cuba. Your way of teaching blew up my mind. All right, now this is a, 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 that's close, very good. So you would just say to blow my mind. Blow up your mind is like kind of exploding, exploding your mind. That's the idea of the phrase, but the actual phrase is to blow my mind. And again, if you heard 10 different people use blow my mind, like, oh, wow, that explanation blew my mind. Oh, he really blew my mind. You know, if you're, you're hearing different people in different situations, then you will feel very confident about using that. So Lucas says, yes, comprehensible input. Uh, so I want to make it clear, Lucas, uh, about how the comprehensible input actually works. So like Krashen talks about uh, getting comprehensible input, and he's talking about over time. But it's important that you don't just repeat the same input, all right? So that's the, it's kind of the, the thing I'm adding to that. Uh, so he's absolutely right that you should be learning English like a native or learning whatever language like a native. But it's important to get the naturally varied review. That tells you uh, how to teach over time to build fluency and memory and confidence and motivation, all right? So you don't want to just get comprehensible input and repeat it. You want to get naturally varied review. <clears throat> All right, Jefferson says, Hi, Andrew. I would like to thank you for all your great lessons. I've learned a lot from you. I'm living here in Boston, and I would love to meet you one day. Uh, it would be great. Yeah, that would be great. I haven't been back to America in, in a couple of years now. Uh, let's see. How do you suppose to exactly? I'm always stuck on this. Well, you're supposed to. It's just when you're making a recommendation about something like, you're supposed to learn this way, but a lot of people don't. You're supposed to. So tomorrow, I'm supposed to. Uh, I'm supposed to go to the dentist, uh, but I think maybe I will not. So I'm supposed to. Supposed to. All right. And also, again, uh, there's the understanding of it, like the understanding of a phrase or expression or grammar point, like supposed to. But when you hear it in a real conversation, it's often supposed to. Yeah, I'm supposed to do this. I'm supposed to do that. All right. So let me put it up on the board for you so you see the difference. Again, this is why we, why we teach people in Fluent for Life. So the learner is down here, so they already have like some understanding and some knowledge, but the native level of speech is up here. It's almost like a different language from here to here, all right? So down here in a regular English classroom, you hear supposed, supposed to. All right, so one example of this, like I am supposed to do something, like tomorrow I should, or it's recommended, or that's the plan, but maybe something will change. Or right now, uh, I'm supposed to be in Africa, but my, I don't know, my plane got canceled and now I'm still in Japan. All right, that's not true, actually. I'm just giving an example. All right, so there's one level of the learning is the vocabulary itself. All right, so understanding really what it means. But you also have to be prepared for how it is in a real conversation, which often sounds more like supposed. 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 Yeah, I'm supposed to do this. I'm supposed to do that. Supposed to. Supposed. 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 All right. People will often, they will be speaking very quickly. They're trying to have uh, just a much more blended, fast way of expressing themselves. Supposed. to. Supposed. to. So this is why you need naturally varied review to get you up to this level. You need to understand the vocabulary, hear it uh, used by different people at different speeds in different time periods. So you understand the grammar, the vocabulary, the pronunciation, and then you really understand this and you feel very confident about hearing it uh, in a conversation. As you go through this process, you feel much more confident about the language, so you speak. Okay, so you could use it, I'm supposed to do this. So I'm explaining it very clearly, I'm supposed to, yeah. So I'm supposed to be sleeping, but you're watching this video instead. Okay, so one example, very good. 
All right, and it, as you hear that, if you heard a hundred different examples of I'm supposed to, you would feel a lot more confident about using it. All right, but it's not just hearing like, again, the, the comprehensible input is like, okay, I kind of understand what it is, but the comprehensible input is really a process. That's what naturally varied review is. Comprehensible input is the process of hearing it uh, over and over and over again, all right, but in different ways. So you're not just repeating something. We're moving you from supposed to, 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 okay? So this is just one example, but the point is to get you from here to here with lots of different vocabulary. And once you're up at this level, now you can really start learning a lot of English in English uh, the same way natives do. All right, let's see what time it is. All right, going for 75 minutes so far. All right, lots of good questions, though. All right, learn English with Mata. Nice to see Good advice over there with, uh, with the muscle arm. There you go. Salima, thank you so much. Lucas says, I can understand almost everything that you're saying, but when it comes to listen to daily conversation or movie, it's very hard to listen to. Again, it's a different language. English in the classroom versus English in the real world. So you have, to, you have to either try to jump directly to that by yourself, which is really hard. So if you try to watch a movie or listen to a conversation, especially a conversation with multiple native speakers in it, it can be very difficult. Your mind is working very hard to try to process all of the information. So it's much easier to go through this in comfortable steps. This is what we do in Fluent for Life. All right, so you can try to do this by yourself. It's much easier like if I'm uh, watching a YouTube video about how to make an espresso, like I showed in that espresso video, uh, you're getting different examples of that uh, in a classroom kind of feel, but it's a native speaker doing that for other native speakers. And then if you just ask a barista, that's like the highest level of that. So if you ask a barista, hey, how do you make an espresso? And they would probably speak very quickly. Uh, they would be blending their sounds, but you would be prepared for that because you watched all of this. If you don't have this and you try to jump directly to this, it's going to be much more, uh, it's going to be much more difficult. Uh, all right. So Vanessa says, hello, oh, do you have a list of native teachers like you, like the FL method? Uh, I don't know about anybody else that teaches the way I do. There are, what, what you will find, especially like here on, <clears throat> here on, uh, on YouTube uh, or, or just other like websites around, you will find other people uh, who do teach English uh, in English, but it's still using like, ESL methods. So actually, if you, if you click on the link in the description uh, below this video, I have an article talking about the five different English language learning methods, and I talk about that. So you've got... Uh, people who are teaching English through another language and using the ESL method. So they're still teaching with translations and telling you grammar rules and things like that. Um, and uh, you also have uh, people who do this, like native speakers who teach English in English. But they're still using, uh, til still telling you grammar rules and still trying to get you to think about things that way instead of helping you understand the grammar like a native. All right. So I don't know if anybody does that. Uh, maybe somebody is, but I, I don't. I don't know. I've not. I've not heard about anybody. Even if you search for like learn English as a first language, uh, it's like I don't know. There's you probably wouldn't get many results for that. Uh, I, I, actually, I think I think this is probably the first video really about like how to learn English as a first language. But I've got lots of examples on our YouTube channel, which we started. Uh, I don't know like over 10 years ago. So even the first videos I made on the YouTube channel are like examples of naturally varied review. Uh, <clears throat> but again, uh, so I don't know, maybe there are people who do that. I'm sure probably more people do it now. A lot of teachers uh, do follow, follow my method and so they're, they're teaching the way uh, I do now. But I'm just I'm trying to make it easier and especially now that we have more resources like Frederick uh, or this playlist and you can find the links for both of those in the description. Slim says, English uh, college is worse and wasting time. Who can agree with that? <laughs> the Pablo says, thanks a lot. The GOAT English teacher, hello, from Mexico. Thank you very much, Pablo. And Cooper from India. Uh, hello, India. So I'm supposed to be sleeping. Yes, so I live close to the White Sox Stadium. Ah, uh, yes. So you live uh, on the south side as well. My dad is a uh, fan of the White Sox. He has season tickets and he goes 
uh, to quite a few games. He holds up signs at the park if you see him over there. <clears throat> Ariel, is it possible to learn English without using your native language? Yes, absolutely. The point is just to learn it. Uh, it should be understandable. So whatever your, whatever your level is, you should already understand uh, at least 80 to 90% or you're getting lots of very easy to understand lessons. Uh, the same way I do it in uh, like Frederick or I do it in that English, uh, like it's, it's basically for beginners, uh, but anybody even who wants to learn things like something like prepositions and adverbs of time and place and that kind of thing, uh, it's good review for adults who are still making basic mistakes. So you can find links for both of those in the description. Uh, little berries along the path. That's a nice name. I can understand what you're saying nearly 100%, but if you ask me a certain question, I don't know where did my English go, how to fix this problem. Thank you. Yeah, so that's it. Again, I bet someone else can give the answer to that. It's naturally varied review. All right. If you understand something, you're at the level of awareness but you don't feel confident using the language. So that means you're not getting enough review to really feel confident about it. So you need to hear more people. And again, like the, the nice thing about this process is you don't need to go anywhere or know anyone to do this. You just need more input, all right? And so you can get this by yourself, uh, like from Fluent for Life, which is what we do. We have it all organized for learners who, can, who are at the level for our program, uh, which is intermediate to advanced. So they know a lot of English, but can't speak fluently. Um, but you can also do it by yourself if you feel confident. It just takes a little bit more time. And usually people are, it, it's, there, there's a lot more vocabulary that's harder to understand. So that's why we like to prepare people for conversations uh, in Fluent for Life. <clears throat> uh, Salima says, yes, uh, English to English is the best way, but it's good for you to have basic English first. Yeah. Your lessons helped me a lot. Great, thanks. Glad to hear it. Uh, so I'm preparing for my IELTS this year. Ah, the IELTS exam, yeah. For me, in, uh, your English is clear enough to understand from Rocco. Yes, so I am being intentionally clear, all right? That's why I say supposed to and not supposed to, like I would in a real conversation. So if I'm talking with a friend of mine, like it's, it's a much different way of speaking, okay? So I'm like a friend of mine might say, uh, hey, are you, are you coming to my house tomorrow? I say, oh, I'm sorry, I can't. I'm supposed to go to my friends. Or I'm supposed to do work. Or I'm supposed to do something in my house. So I have a plan to do something. But notice how I'm, I'm kind of mumbling my words because I, like he understands what I'm talking about. He knows those language patterns so well that he can understand them even if, it, even if I'm not being clear about them. Yeah, I'm supposed to do something tomorrow. I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to spend time with my wife. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't come over tomorrow. I'm supposed to spend time with my wife. I'm supposed to spend time with my wife, okay? So the, 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 like the, the words don't really change, but the actual way of communication is so different. Um, so this is why if you try to go from this level to this level by watching movies or trying to get into a conversation before you feel comfortable, then of course it's going to be frustrating for you. Even if you understand people, you will still feel less confident about speaking. And your replies will likely be very simple. So people will say something, blah, 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 blah. And maybe you understand some of it and you say, ah, yes or no. <laughs> All right. El says, how often do you make videos? Uh, lately, I've been doing like once a week. But I don't know, like this past week, I, I was excited to make uh, this video. People have been asking me for a video about uh, um, like how to teach English. So teachers are asking me how, for a video on how to teach English. Uh, but really the easiest way to see that is just to see the examples of it. So rather than, I, I kind of covered some, some theory and, and things about psychology in this video. But if you look at the examples of how to do it, it's just getting information that you understand in English and lots of varied repetition. Okay, so it's not like rote repetition with the exact same thing over and over again. You want to get varied review. That's why it's called naturally varied review. <clears throat> uh, so, Elena, can I practice? Uh, I can practice my lessons. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so, Danielle says, I have a question. In order to reach the fluency in English, I need to learn new words every day or practice words that I already know. All right, uh, so good question, Danielle. Let me make this clear for everyone. 
what you what you usually find in uh, ESL learning, and this is even ESL videos right here on YouTube, uh, is you will find something that's like uh, like here's 10, 10 new phrases to learn about whatever. So you'll learn one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, uh, and and what happens is like maybe. Uh, you might remember the first one or the last one. There are kind of psychology reasons why this happens. Like usually you remember more the first thing you hear or the last thing you hear, but the stuff in the middle you usually forget. Um, but in general, these things will probably be forgotten also if you don't review them, all right? So the, the goal is not to learn more vocabulary. Uh, it's to actually know the vocabulary you know very well. All right. So if we imagine how a native learns, so if we look at the e English as a first language approach, so a child, we imagine this is like, uh, this is an adult, uh, and this is a native, native child. So the native child, let's say they learn uh, three new words, they are going to hear that again and again and again, but in different ways. All right. So your goal as a learner is to do what they do. So if you learn this way, you will get fluent like they do, all right? Remember, how you learn is how you speak. How you learn is how you speak. How you learn is how you speak. I say this over and over and over again. Uh, and again, the point is not just to just repeat that. I want to make it very clear. You're not just learning one thing and repeating it again and again. Uh, I gave an example of uh, teaching my daughter. Again, I understand these things about learning, so I'm, and I'm trying to teach my kids in as, as efficiently as I can. So I want to teach them quickly. I don't have a lot of time to teach them, and they spend most of their time in English. So the only way for me to make sure they really get like English, uh, like learning English well uh, with the time I spend. Yeah, exactly. Very good. So we got harsh. So I gave that, and you remember, uh, Vado, remember the word. Excellent. Uh, and so Vado likely remembers that because I gave so much varied review. All right. So my daughter asked me when I was walking her to school, I said, oh, uh, you know, you're, you wanted to ask me something. And she said, yeah, what is what is harsh mean? All right. So she just gives me a word. Now, I could just give her an explanation or a definition of the word. I say, oh, harsh means, I don't know, like difficult or something and just give her a definition. But instead, what I want to do is really help her understand it so I can give her ownership of the word, okay? I want to give her ownership of the word so she really understands it. So I want to give her uh, lots of different definitions uh, or different examples of it in different ways. And so we have a word like harsh, and I'd say, well, where did you hear that? And then she tells me, okay, like, you know, someone's kind of yelling at somebody else. I say, oh, like, so they, the, the person was like, don't be so harsh. It's like, oh, like, don't be kind of mean or difficult or make something like make it hard for me, something. I said, oh, maybe there was like some harsh, some harsh language. So like using some harsh words. So if someone is yelling at me, they're like, oh, you're a bad teacher and like you suck. And like, why don't you get some different colored markers? You always use like red and blue or whatever. This is just what I have. So people get angry at me. I say, whoa, whoa, whoa why are you so harsh? Don't be so harsh. <laughs> so don't be so like mean and difficult. All right. So that's one way of using it. We might also have like harsh weather. So on that day we were walking, it was a little bit colder. I said, well, uh, this weather is okay, but if we really have, so again, Vato with some harsh weather, uh, wow, now it's like, it's like a blizzard, got lots of snow, very cold, and uh, oh my goodness. And so as I'm giving her all of those examples, I think maybe two days ago, I was thinking about that again, and I said, hey, Ari, what does harsh mean? And she was just like, difficult. You know, so she gave me like, you know, just like a basic explanation, but it's because she now understands what this means. She has ownership of the word. So she can talk about harsh weather, uh, like a harsh environment. Like if you live out in the desert and the sun is beating down on you every day, like to beat down on you, like, oh, like that crazy sun is beating down on me. Uh, that's a harsh environment. So it's difficult to live in. Okay. So when you're getting vocabulary, uh, the point is not to, uh, to learn like one thing and then quickly go to the next before you understand it. If you can understand something and use it fluently right away, that's great. Then you can you know, just keep going, but most people are not doing that. 
they learn one thing, uh, and and this this whole system just like it just promotes people wasting time on you know watching YouTube videos or whatever uh, that don't actually help them. Uh, the publisher says, should I try to read books in English? I want to teach my daughter. She's two years old. Uh, yeah, so you can get naturally varied review, and and uh, books are a great way to do that. There's also a study. Um, on my on my site, you can look at the uh, the one about I think we talked about reading, uh, but this is about teaching Japanese students like these two different ways. Uh, so if you click on the link for the five learning methods, you can learn more about that. Uh, you, there's a link to that study also. Uh, but yeah, so you can read or you can listen or you can watch, and you should be getting all of this material from different places. If you only read, it really slows down the language for you, and you need to hear how natives are really saying things. Uh, but if you do that, it will of course help you improve. So I learn a lot of Japanese from reading uh, as well as you know listening to people or watching movies or something like that. Uh, but reading is a great way to do that. Uh, you can also uh, have her play with Frederick uh, so she could even start with level one with the alphabet and teach herself the language very quickly uh, that way. So even my when my girls were two years old I started them using it um, and so now, now they can read uh, and again, it's, it's pretty simple how it works. Like if you're letting kids discover things for themselves, uh, it's much easier than trying to tell them what stuff means. Anyway, uh, but yes, uh, reading is a very good idea. Uh, Lucas again, uh, let's see, me saying that thing every time when I don't know the right word. Yeah, <laughs> that thing, that thing, yep. How many words does it take to be fluent in English, asks Ariel. Okay, uh, this idea about how many words it takes to be fluent in English, hopefully the, the example of a child uh, and, a, and, a, and an adult learner makes sense for, for people understanding this. The, the, if we imagine each one of these little dots is a vocabulary, you know, could be a phrase or a word or a grammar point or something, and this is the same thing for a native over here. It doesn't matter how many you know because you get fluent in each individual word or phrase as you know it. All right. So either you know that either you know that phrase by itself, uh, either you can use it well or you cannot. All right. So what usually happens for learners is they have most of their vocabulary they can't use fluently. They can understand it. They have that passive level of understanding. Uh, but they don't, they can't actually use it fluently. They don't have like enough review and they don't have that confidence about it. But natives, they might have a smaller vocabulary. They might know fewer words, but they really feel strong about all of this vocabulary. Okay? So obviously when a child learns something new, uh, if they only hear it one time, they will forget that. So that's why I need to practice the word harsh with my daughter, uh, so she hears it again and again and then develops that fluency with it, all right? So the, the, the idea that you need to have a certain number before you get fluent doesn't really make any sense because you actually get fluent in individual words and phrases, all right? So you don't, you don't think about like, okay, now I know 100 words and so I can speak fluently, but lots of learners know maybe 1,000 words but still can't speak. Okay, so it's not how many words you know, it's how well you speak. How well do you know that vocabulary? All right, and it depends, again, you will have most things that maybe you know to a passive level and some things you know at the ownership level. All right, so don't worry about trying to, trying to build up uh, fluency by building your vocabulary. It doesn't work that way. Uh, Salima says, last question, when I speak uh, English people around me, like my classmates and colleagues, they tell me my English is very good, but I don't feel that inside me. What can I do with that problem? Uh, it, it depends on how good, I, I, I don't know how you speak. If your speech is actually good, maybe you're, you know, you just have a self-confidence issue about that, and maybe you're worried about some small things about that. Uh, usually, like English speakers can be, uh, they're more honest, usually, uh, like more honest than, let's say, like Jap Japanese speakers. So out here in Japan, I could say, I could pronounce Japanese badly and speak it badly, and people would say, oh, wow, your Japanese is so good. <laughs> you know, so I, I'm, I'm, I understand, like, when people are, are giving me a compliment, it's, it's more like a social communication thing. Um, you know, just 
trying to have like a good relationship rather than like actually saying my Japanese is good. Um, so I know when, when people are actually impressed by my Japanese or when they're not. Um, so I'll give you an example of that. Uh, this was a couple of years ago. I was at a uh, business, it was like a business dinner uh, with some, with various, it was like Japanese business owners and one guy who used to be the, uh, he was like the, like the vice governor of the, of like the Nagasaki prefecture. Um, but anyway, so we were having a meeting. Uh, it was just a dinner meeting and I was being introduced. Uh, so each one of us, you know, like the, the speaker who organized it, he was just intro introducing all of us. And then he introduced me. He was like, ah, this is Drew. He's from America. Uh, and I was like, and I said like, oh, I've been found out <laughs> in Japanese. I was like, ah, uh, and everybody started laughing. Uh, and so they, they like, because the joke is like, it's all a bunch of Japanese people and me, I'm clearly not Japanese based on how I look. So I was making a joke that like, uh oh, they found me out that I'm not Japanese. Uh, but in, in that case, like I didn't need anyone to tell me, oh, your Japanese is good. Like you, I made like a very good joke. It was a very simple example uh, in that situation. Uh, and people laughed and I understood like th that was like them showing respect to my ability. Like even though I didn't speak a lot, I was just, I really said one word, uh, but it was well-timed and people understood like my use of the language was very good. Um, so again, it, it could be like a psychology thing where, you know, maybe you're hard on yourself for whatever reason. Um, but often, you know, a lot, a lot of people like they, uh, even if their language is good, they still have just issues about Maybe they don't feel confident or they're, they're not perfect or something like that. Uh, but remember the value you can give to people in conversations, even if it's only like listening that you're really good at. Most people actually are much more, uh, they're better speakers than they think. All right. Hopefully that makes more sense. Oh my goodness. All right. Well, this, this video has gone on way longer than I anticipated. <laughs> so I'm going to have to go through these last 12 questions in about one minute here. Uh, so in EFL, we have to learn one word in different contexts. It's not about just like one word. It's all of the vocabulary you learn. It just, it just needs to be understandable and it's easier if it's in context. So if I, if I hold a marker and show you something like I'm, uh, like flipping, flipping the marker up, flip up the marker like that, it's easier for you to understand that rather than me telling you a translation or definition. Uh, let's see. I had similar experience with Slima. Yeah. So again, it, it depends on what your specific issue and your, your actual level with the language. Hello, I'm Marcella from Brazil. I love English and I'm learning English alone by YouTube. Yep. And you can get fluent that way too. Uh, my mistake is learning words that I will rarely use. So we can choose words to learn because I think uh, wasting my time learning useless words. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so the, the basic idea is that you should learn what you would need for your life. So this is why in Fluent for Life, what people are doing is they're selecting particular topics that they need for their life. So a lawyer would watch lesson sets about communication and debating and law and things like that. And maybe a person in sales would focus on other things about marketing and other things like that. All right. So whatever you're doing, if you're a barista, watch videos about people making coffee in English. It's pretty easy, all right? So focus on the stuff you actually need for your life and that's going to make you, number one, more motivated. Uh, you'll be more excited because you're actually using it and it'll be easier to learn, all right? So you'll already have some kind of context for it. But in general, ESL is going to teach you the language but make it more difficult to speak. EFL is going to actually teach you the language and make you a fluent speaker automatically, even if you don't speak, all right? So if you'd like to learn more, I'm going to have to shut it down because I'm now out of time. It's already 12 o'clock noon. I, oh, wow, just time flew by. Oh my goodness. Hopefully this has been an entertaining video for you. Uh, it's been a pleasure joining you today. Uh, if you're watching this later, go ahead and uh, click on the links in the description. Uh, so those resources are available. Uh, and especially if you're a teacher, uh, definitely watch the, uh, the video series about uh, learning English in English and get Frederick if you don't have that already. Uh, that will show you even adult learners are using that to improve their vocabulary and their listening and their pronunciation. Uh, but let's see. Yeah, good night. <laughs> but hopefully you've enjoyed this. If you have, please share it with other people, especially other teachers of language. And I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.